Okay, so the topic of this video is the genetics inheritance pattern known as, known as autosomal recessive inheritance. So let's get started. So here's the Henderson family. They've been happily married for eight years. The square represents Dylan, the male, and the circle represents Maria, the female. Okay, so they have a six-year-old daughter named Sophia. Because Sophia is female, the circle represents Sophia. They also have a three-year-old son named Nicholas. Because Nicholas is a male, we use a square to represent him in the diagram. And they just welcome the birth of little baby Joshua. Because Joshua is a male, we have another square in the diagram. So that diagram represents the five members of the Henderson family. And here's their doctor who uh, has helped them through the pregnancy. And he says, hello, Hendersons, please sit down. There's a situation we need to discuss. You know, newborn babies are often tested shortly after birth with hopes of detecting certain genetic disorders. And Joshua, sadly, has tested positive for a disorder called phenylketonuria, or PKU, more commonly called PKU. And he informs... Uh, the Hendersons, that PKU is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder. Well, Mr. Henderson says, you know, it's been a lot of years since high school biology class. W what does this mean? What does autosomal recessive inheritance mean? And our doctor says, well, let's start with the word autosome. Here is a karyotype. It's a picture of a person's chromosomes, perhaps Joshua's chromosomes. And if you recall, when we learned about karyotypes earlier in the school year, the X and Y chromosome here are, are the sex chromosomes of a male. But the other chromosomes, chromosome pairs 1 through 22, are called autosomes. And so an autosome is a non-sex chromosome. It's a chromosome that has no genes on it that influences one's gender. And so autosomal disorders are caused by a gene found on one of these 22 non-sex chromosomes here. If a gene is found on the X chromosome or the Y chromosome, it's called sex-linked. You know, maybe you've heard of the disorder called hemophilia. Hemophilia is an example of a disorder caused by a gene on the X chromosome. Hemophilia is what we call a sex-linked disorder. Now that's something we're gonna learn another day, but today we're focusing on the autosomes. You know, one example of an autosomal disorder you might have heard of is sickle cell disease. It's an autosome because the gene that causes sickle cell has been located to be found on chromosome 11. Notice how chromosome 11 is an autosome so sickle cell is an autosomal disorder. And if you're familiar with sickle cell disease, you know, normally red blood cells will roll and travel freely through the blood vessels. But for people who have sickle cell, the red blood cells are, are misshapen. They're kind of deformed. And so they're less likely to roll freely and, and they carry less oxygen. They're more likely to clog. And the reason that uh, this is called sickle cell disease is the red blood cells are often sickle shaped, uh, kind of like you see in that picture there. So they're misshapen. Well, you know, another example of an autosomal, autosomal disorder you might have heard of is cystic fibrosis. Well, why is cystic fibrosis an autosomal disorder? Well, that's because the gene responsible for cystic fibrosis has been located to be found on chromosome number seven. You know, if you're not familiar with cystic fibrosis, you know, here's kind of an overview. Normally, the cystic fibrosis protein is made from 1,480 amino acids, and that's what those circles represent, are the amino acids all chained together to make the cystic fibrosis protein. And so normally, when the protein is made, the amino acids will twist and fold and wrap into this three-dimensional protein. Uh, protein here. But people who have cystic fibrosis, unfortunately, they're lacking that 508th amino acid out of the chain of 1,480. And as a result, 
when the protein twists and folds and wraps, its shape is altered just a little bit. And that sadly causes the disorder called cystic fibrosis. You know, one of the more defining features of people with cystic fibrosis is that their lungs often fill up with a mucus, which then becomes a breeding ground for bacteria that causes a lot of strain on their health. Well, our Henderson family, they're seeing the doctor today because they've just been told some news that their newborn child has PKU, phenylketonuria. Uh, PKU is an, another example of an autosomal recessive disorder. It's autosomal because the gene has been located on chromosome 12. The gene responsible for this disorder is found on chromosome 12. Chromosome 12 is an autosome. PKU is a disorder where people don't process an amino acid called phenylalanine. Normally, phenylalanine gets processed and changed into uh, another amino acid called tyrosine, and tyrosine bonds with a bunch of other amino acids to make a protein called melanin. But people with PKU, they lack the enzyme needed to change phenylalanine into tyrosine. So what happens is the phenylalanine just starts to build up and build up and build up in the person's bloodstream, and this actually interferes with the person's brain development and can cause some very serious mental disabilities if not identified and treated. So the fact that our little cartoon Joshua has been identified at birth is actually a very good, uh, good step in treatment. And so the Guthrie test, this is a blood test performed on infants to test for PKU. It's a blood test and this is how our little cartoon baby Joshua was diagnosed. So let's go back to our story here. Uh, how did Joshua, Mrs. Henderson wants to know, how did Joshua obtain this disorder? Both Dylan and her are fine, and so are her, are her other children, Sophia and Nicholas. They don't have PKU. So how did Joshua obtain this disorder? Well, the doctor says, let's talk about genotypes. A person can either be homozygous dominant, and that would be two capital letters to represent the alleles. I, I happen to use the letters H in a moment, and you'll see why. Or another example of a genotype, a person can be homozygous recessive, two lowercase h h's, and you'll see why I use the letter H again in a moment. Or there's the possibility that a person might inherit one dominant allele and one recessive allele, and this is called heterozygous. Now, when it comes to autosomal recessive inheritance, the rule is that sufferers of these disorders must inherit two alleles, one from the mom and one from the dad, in order to have this disorder. That means healthy is dominant, and the disorder is recessive. And that's why I use the letter H when I do my Punnett squares. Whatever the dominant disorder is, that's the letter of the alphabet I have chosen. Since healthy is dominant, I chose a, a, a capital H to represent healthy, and therefore the lowercase h would represent unhealthy or having the disorder. Now, I know that Mr. Henderson is healthy, so he has to be one of those two combinations right there. He's either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Same for Mrs. Henderson. She's healthy from the story. She said she's healthy. So she has to be one of those two combinations because the lower combination, the two lowercase h's, that's how the person would have the disorder. Well, Mr. Henderson and Mrs. Henderson do not have the disorder, but their child does. So Joshua has the disorder. He must be two, uh, he must have two recessive alleles. He must be homozygous recessive. Well, where did he get those two recessive alleles from? He had to get them from his parents. Even though, even though Mr. and Mrs. Henderson are healthy, they each must possess a recessive allele. And they each had to pass this recessive allele on to baby Joshua. That's how, J how baby Joshua inherited this disorder. Well, what about their other children? Maybe Sophia is heterozygous. Maybe she inherited a dominant allele from one parent and a recessive allele from the other. 
But maybe Sophia is homozygous dominant. We, we just don't know. All we know is right now from this story, all we know is that she's healthy. She does not have the disorder. Same with Nicholas, their other child here. We know he's healthy from the story. We were told he was healthy, but he could be heterozygous. Maybe he got a dominant allele from one parent and a recessive allele from another. Or maybe he's homozygous dominant. Maybe he received a dominant allele from each of his parents. We don't know for certain. We just know that Sophia and Nicholas are healthy. And so let's examine a Punnett square. We learned earlier that Mr. and Mrs. Henderson both have to be heterozygous. They're healthy, but they still produce the child with the disorder. So when we fill in the Punnett square, you can see that there is a three out of four chance to produce a healthy uh, individual, but a one out of four chance to produce an individual with this disorder. And so the odds that little baby Joshua inherited this disorder, PKU, was only 25%, one square out of four, but sadly it happened. And so Mrs. Henderson says, does that mean that Sophia and Nicholas each had a 50-50 chance of being a carrier when they were born? Notice the Punnett square. Two squares out of four would result in a carrier, a heterozygous individual. And the doctor says, yes, as did Joshua. Joshua had a 50-50 chance of being a carrier as well. Unfortunately, it didn't work that way for him. Unfortunately, Joshua inherited the disorder. If we look at this pedigree right here, squares represent males and circles represent females. So we already know that Mr. and Mrs. Henderson are heterozygous. One way that we can symbolically show this in a pedigree is to partially color in the square and partially color in the circle for Dylan and Maria. That means that they're carriers, they're heterozygous. Well, we know they had to, each of them had to pass a recessive allele to baby Joshua. He has the disorder. And so in a pedigree, what we tend to do is we tend to color in the circle or the square circle if it's a female, square if it's a male, if they have the disorder. Now with Sophia and Nicholas, again, we don't know their genotype. We know they're healthy, so they have to have one capital H, but we don't know what their second allele might be. Well, Mr. Henderson wants to know, well, what can we do now to help Joshua now that he's been identified as having the disorder PKU? And our doctor says, you know, PKU can actually be treated by following a special diet. I'm gonna schedule a meeting with a nutritionist. They can teach you proper care of, of little baby Joshua. And thank you for your help today, doctor. And uh, that's kind of the end of this, this uh, story right here. Okay, so try to answer these five questions. You know, pause the video. When you're ready, hit the play button and let's go over them together. I'm gonna to go over the answers in three, two, one. So the story says that Maria is heterozygous. So that's her genotype, one uppercase letter, one lowercase letter. So I can add her to my Punnett square. Question number two, what is Jeff's genotype? Well, the story said that he suffers from cystic fibrosis. So he has to be homozygous recessive. I can now add him to the Punnett square. So when I fill in the four Punnett squares here, I can now answer questions three, four, and five. Number three, what's the probability that they produce a healthy child? Two squares out of four, 50%. What about number four? What is the probability that they have a homozygous dominant child? I hope you see the answer is zero. Homozygous dominant would be two uppercase H's. None of the four Punnett squares have that combination. And then number five, what's the probability they have a child born with this life-threatening disorder? That is also 50%. Two squares out of four have the homozygous recessive combination. And so there you go. I hope uh, that helps, under, uh, helps explain what autosomal recessive inheritance is. If you're in my class, you know, pause the video, try to answer these nine questions here. I'm happy to check your answers before school or after school one day. And thank you for watching.